Hello and good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to the European Central Bank and our first webinar with civil society organizations. My name is uh, Viktor Krzyżanowski and I'm with the ECB's Directorate General Communications. As you may know, last week the Governing Council of the ECB met and considered the new ECB staff macroeconomic projections, which for the first time fully in included the potential impact of the pandemic on the economy and the future. We are joined today by Frank Smets, Director General Economics of the ECB, who kindly agreed to walk us through the latest uh, projections that he and his team put together. Uh, Frank will also give us an overview of the ECB policy response to the pandemic, and he will also be with us to answer any questions you may have and hear your comments on those projections. I'm sure by now we are all acquainted with uh, virtual events. Uh, let me therefore just state a few obvious things. You should be able to see myself and Frank now. We will also share some slides with you later on. Those slides will also be available on the ECB website after the event. In case, um, in case you're wondering why you can't see any other participants, please note that this is a feature of the tool we are using. But at any moment, you may interact with me and my colleagues helping facilitate this webinar through the chat function. Please only remember to chat with all panelists. Thank you very much. I can see you. At this stage, all participants are muted and can't use their cameras. In the Q&A session, you will be able to speak and also turn on your camera if you so wish. As indicated in the invitations, this webinar is recorded and the recording together with the slides will be published after the event on the ECB website. Now, without uh, further ado, let me turn to Frank Smets for his presentation. Frank, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Victor. It's a, it's a great pleasure to be here and welcome uh, to this uh, first webinar. Um, it's about the impact of uh, the COVID-19 pandemic on the euro area economy and, and some of the, the policy uh, responses. And uh, obviously, uh, I, I, my presentation will very much be, be based on the new macroeconomic uh, projections that we uh, released and, and published uh, last Thursday on the occasion of uh, the last monetary policy meeting of the Governing Council. Before I go into uh, these, uh, these projections, uh, I think it's probably useful to, to take a step back and uh, review a little bit uh, the three stages uh, that one can uh, distinguish in, in terms of the impact of the, the pandemic on economic activity in the euro area and, and more generally uh, on the, the global uh, economy. I mean, the, the COVID-19 pandemic is, of course, first and foremost, uh, a health crisis. And uh, it's, it's a, a tragic uh, crisis for those of us who, who, who are uh, affected uh, and, and have passed away and, and their, their families. But it also has uh, left a very uh, strong and, and deep and sudden impact on, on the economy, uh, as, as, as you know. And to describe uh, sort of the, the, the three uh, phases of, of the impact of the pandemic on the economy, I, I sometimes find it useful to make uh, sort of a medical uh, analogy. I think it was probably Paul Krugman who, who, who at least I heard the first time used that uh, analogy um, of the economy being put in an artificial coma, very much like those of us who are affected uh, seriously. Um, what governments have done in, in the first phase is to, in many cases, lock down uh, the economies and put the economy in an uh, artificial uh, coma. And this, of course, is very different from, from any uh, s uh, other recession or, or cyclical uh, drop in, in economic activity that we've seen definitely in the monetary union, but even going back in uh, history. So that's the first phase, the lockdown uh, phase. Then comes the second phase uh, when uh, the, the patient, the economy is, uh, springs back to life. Uh, now, that's a phase where we'll see a very quick bounce back in economic uh, activity. Um, but obviously, uh, not everything has been uh, healed. And, and the recovery at this stage, the patient may still be hospitalized, uh, needs still to be taken care of, and the recovery is likely to be uh, incomplete. And that's also something uh, that we will see. And then there's, so that's the recovery of bounce back uh, phase. And then there's a third phase, 
uh, when the patient is allowed to, to, go, to go home and sort of return to his uh, previous uh, life or the economy is, is going back to uh, normal. But then there's two questions. First of all, uh, have there been any scars uh, from having spent time in, in, in lockdown and with uh, containment? Uh, and of course, that is something to look into. And secondly, um, do we have to change our ways? Uh, no, very much like a patient may have to change uh, his uh, uh, nutritional uh, habits, uh, maybe also on, on the economy side. Uh, there, not everything will be the same as, as, as before. And, and I guess I don't have to, to explain some of the, the changes that uh, we will be expecting. So if, if uh, Victor, you can put on uh, the first uh, slide, I just want to, to uh, talk you a little bit through our projections um, using those three phases, if, if you like. So what you see here on the, the left-hand side is uh, the quarter, our estimates for the quarterly uh, GDP uh, growth rate of the euro area economy uh, and the changes from the June to the September uh, projections. The, the hard data that we now have pertain to Q2, so that's the, the second quarter of, uh, of this year, and that's the, the second uh, pair of uh, bars. And so what we know is that this lockdown period has left uh, a very large imprint on economic activity in the euro area of about, it, here it says 12%. Uh, this is in our forecast. This was before we knew the revised number of minus 11.8%. Uh, in that uh, quarter. Now, this was the result mostly of uh, the economy being in this artificial coma, in this uh, lockdown, which of course in some countries started early, like Italy in February, end of February, in others a bit late, but it was basically a relatively short period of two months, ending uh, beginning of uh, May. Um, but of course it left a big impact in the first half if you add first and second quarter, we're talking about a drop of about 15%, which is all, probably almost three times as large uh, than what we have seen in, in the great financial uh, crisis in, in 2008, 2009. Now, one thing that I think is interesting to, to highlight in, in this episode is that also, the, apart from the, the suddenness and the size of the drop in economic activity, which again was related to you know, the outbreak of the pandemic, uh, also, some of the other features are quite different from what a usual business cycle or usual recession uh, looks like. In particular, uh, usually it's manufacturing and construction that lead the, the recession. In this case, uh, it's mostly services. So about two thirds of that drop uh, are in the services sector. And of course, we understand why, because it's mostly services that have been uh, affected. Uh, think about hospitality, hotels, restaurants, travel, leisure activities uh, by uh, the lockdown and by the containment uh, measures. Now this has one impl implication because the services sector is relatively more labor intensive than uh, particularly manufacturing. Um, we have to be watchful of what is going on in, in, in the labor market and any differences that we see relative to, to other uh, recessions. We've moved into the second phase, which is this bounce back, this uh, sudden recovery, the, 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 the economy springing back to life, basically as of May. May and particularly June, July, and to a lesser extent, uh, August. And this will, so we were now at the end of uh, the third quarter, so we have a pretty good idea of what uh, the, the growth uh, outcome will be in, in the third quarter, and that's the, the third set of uh, bars there. So we, we expect uh, that this will be around uh, a positive number, rather than minus 12, a positive plus 8%. So uh, significant uh, uh, growth in this uh, third quarter, mostly concentrated in second half of May, June, uh, uh, July. And these estimates are very much in line with, with our projections of, of, of June. So the good news is that uh, basically, if anything, uh, some of uh, the, the, the negative effects that we had expected are a little bit less 
than we what we had expected, but obviously still still uh, quite uh, quite uh, bad. Now, as we move into uh, the fourth quarter, uh, we will see, and we are already seeing in some of our uh, indicators, like uh, the PMI indicators or, or confidence indicators, and also in some of the, the high frequency uh, data, the mobility data, the credit card data, and so on that we look at, that there is a slowdown of this sudden uh, uh, recovery in, in August, partly also driven uh, in services, partly driven by the fact that in a number of countries we've seen sort of a rise in infections, uh, although you know, the implications so far for hospitalization and, and uh, deaths has, has, has been much less than in, in the first wave. But it's natural, and again, this is also something that we, we foresaw in, in June, that so this big bounce back will now moderate and we will have a slow convergence to more normal uh, growth rates, uh, which are in the area of 0.4, 0 0.5%. Uh, I mean, for a while, hopefully, they will be a bit higher than that as the economy is, is trying to converge to the new economy. Now, another important element to, to emphasize in our projection is, is more shown uh, on the right-hand side. Now, you know, there's a lot of discussion what type of letter should uh, ca characterizes the, the recession and, and the recovery. I mean, if you look at levels, uh, as we do here on the right-hand side, it's not so much a letter, it's, it's, it's what some have called uh, the, the square root symbol. You no, know? uh, Remember from your algebra uh, lessons. I mean, it's a little bit the square root with, a, uh, with the second leg, maybe normally would be a bit higher, uh, but that's what we're having. And of course, the important uh, feature of this is that the third phase, which is the normalization and I would say transformation phase, to the extent that we have to transform to the new normal, to the new economy, um, will be relatively slow. So in our forecast, uh, we assume that only in the third quarter of 2022, uh, we will reach uh, the level, the pre-pandemic level of economic activity. And this will still be about three to four percent below what we would have expected the economy to be uh, uh, in, in, in March uh, uh, of, of, of this year. So we do assume that there will be some scarring uh, and some, some, some slow-paced healing necessary to, to bring the economy back to uh, its, uh, its, its pace of growth and level of growth uh, before. So if you think about where we are now, we are basically in this transition from the big bounce back to the normalization and transformation uh, phase. And that brings a lot of uh, uncertainty for us macroeconomists trying to, um, trying to uh, uh, forecast and project uh, the economy. In the projections article that we published on Thursday, uh, you will see, like in the June projection, that we have also uh, developed two uh, alternative scenarios which basically are a function of the, uh, the narrative on the pandemic. So it's a one a mild scenario where we assume, and there were some expectations in the markets about this, that maybe a vaccine will uh, be found uh, earlier than we assume in the baseline scenario, which is uh, basically by the summer of uh, next year. So that would lead to a sort of a more positive uh, outcome. And another more severe scenario where we would have some sort of second, serious second wave with uh, maybe not again a full lockdown, which uh, uh, we know governments uh, definitely want to, to, will want to avoid uh, if at all possible, uh, but where uh, the containment measure will be strengthened, the economy will uh, suffer again. So one big source of uncertainty is, uh, as, as you all know, uh, what will happen to uh, to the to the pandemic and and uh, of course we're not epidemiologists uh, we read the literature uh, but uh, the only thing we can do is is, is think about different uh, different scenarios as i said in the baseline that i showed basically we expect containment measures of some sort to last until well into uh, the next year but then a vaccine to be operative as of uh, the summer of uh, next year now, the other 
sources of uncertainty that uh, we are facing and that we have to acknowledge also in our uh, policy making, both at the central bank, but also uh, by governance and supervisors, is uh, that uh, there's a lot of uncertainty about the economic and financial implications of these containment uh, measures. Uh, um, uh, first of all, uh, I would highlight uh, the behavior of consumers. Uh, an important you know, feature of this recession is that it's consumption driven. No, uh, services and consumption rather than investment, which in usual uh, recessions is the more volatile uh, component. What we've seen is that because uh, governments have put in very significant support measures, including short uh, time working arrangements, no, furloughing uh, arrangements, that actually disposable income in the aggregate has not fallen that much. It has. Uh, been reduced, the growth rate has been reduced, but not uh, as much as we've seen the fall in economic activity, whereas consumption has dropped uh, a lot. And we see in the second quarter, because of that, a big increase in the savings rate. Basically, underlying our forecast is a doubling of the savings ratio uh, in the second quarter from an average of 12 to 13 percent to almost 25 percent in the second quarter. And so a big uncertainty uh, in trying to foresee what will happen uh, in the next quarters is what will uh, the consumers, the households do with this accumulated uh, saving? Will this uh, normalize quickly? Um, will there be pent up demand? And actually we could have even uh, lower savings rates than, 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 than before uh, or not. Uh, we've done quite a bit of analysis to, to try to distinguish you know, how much of the saving is this forced saving, just because consumers, I mean, could not consume, they could not go to restaurants, they could not uh, travel. Uh, and what part is, is more precautionary saving? Because the uncertainty is very high. Uh, consumers basically want to save uh, money uh, for bad times to, to come. And we find that precautionary saving is uh, an important component, but obviously the biggest part is this, this uh, 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 forced uh, saving. And so a big question, and uh, we've made the assumption that actually the savings rate would gradually fall back uh, over the projection horizon to uh, where it was before the pandemic, is exactly where do you see this balance between pent up demand, which would sort of be a boost to the economy, versus precautionary saving, which uh, uh, would uh, be a drag uh, on the economy. So we have in our forecast quite a, a bit of drag uh, in, in, in the economy. Uh, now, of course, we can influence this partly by good policy, which reduces uh, the, uh, the uncertainty. A second uh, source of uncertainty uh, that we have, and of course it's linked also to the first uncertainty about savings behavior, is what's going on in the labor market. It's very difficult uh, nowadays to read uh, the labor market with our usual indicators. On the one hand, we see that unemployment has increased, uh, measured unemployment, but not to the same extent as we had expected in uh, June. In, in June, we had expected that actually would increase to close to 10%. In fact, it has only increased to somewhat below 8%. <clears throat> and so the question is, uh, is this a good indicator of the slack that we see in the labor market? Probably not. It underestimates uh, the amount of slack. If we look at hours worked, uh, we see that there's a much deeper uh, recession also in the labor market, basically a 15% drop in uh, the first half of uh, hours worked. And of course, the discrepancy is, is partly related to how, what assumptions do you uh, assume about uh, uh, what uh, will happen after some of these uh, furlough arrangements, these short-term working arrangements, and some of the other support measures uh, will uh, run out. So that's, that's, again, a big uncertainty. And of course, uh, what will happen there? How many of the jobs of, of those employees, which is a large uh, uh, number, uh, we're talking about uh, more than 10% of, of uh, the, the labor supply that are now on short-term working, how much, how many of those employees will go back uh, and work full-time uh, for their uh, firms, and how ma many of those uh, will eventually 
uh, need to look for 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 other uh, other uh, jobs. So we assume in our forecast that there will be some fallout, that the unemployment rate will rise uh, in in the coming uh, quarters to to probably something uh, below uh, ten uh, percent, and of course that will also be a drag uh, on 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 the economy and will put downward pressure on on prices. Let me um, speed up a little bit and say, that, of course, there are two more uh, factors of uncertainty when trying to read uh, the economy. Um, what will happen to firms? Um, many of the measures that we took as uh, ECB were to support credit to firms, including small and medium-sized uh, enterprises through our lending uh, operations. Um, and of course, that has gone hand in hand with what uh, governments have done in terms of guaranteeing some of those credits. We talk about 20% of GDP of guarantees uh, by, by governments in the, in the Eurozone. Uh, and with supervisory uh, measures where uh, we uh, have the, our supervisors, our SSM uh, has given some leeway to, 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 to banks uh, in terms of also accounting for uh, some of those uh, credits that uh, are under moratoria and that at the moment are not being paid back or that are uh, uh, guaranteed. So one question, that's the third source of uncertainty, is indeed um, what will happen after some, sorry, <coughs> let me just take a sip. Uh, what will happen after uh, some of these, these measures? Um, and of course, the, the, the main idea is there uh, to make sure that there are no cliff effects so that these measures are gradually uh, phased out depending on, on how the economy is moving. Um, and, uh, it, but they need I mean, eventually to be phased out in order to also allow for the reallocation of uh, resources uh, that will be necessary following uh, the pandemic. Um, and that leads then to the last phase of, of, of factor of uncertainty, which is what will all this mean for the banks? Um, once some of these credit guarantees uh, uh, run out. Um, so far, uh, the bank credit has been very supportive. We had a big increase in uh, bank loan growth uh, from 3% to 7% uh, during the pandemic. Um, but banks, of course, have also indicated that this may not last uh, forever if uh, uh, in the end, uh, some some bankruptcies and defaults uh, take place, which to some extent will take place, but uh, hopefully to to a limited uh, extent. So this is more or less uh, the picture we have on on the growth side. Let me be relatively brief, so that we have enough time also for a Q and A on what this all means for inflation. Uh, obviously. Uh, our mandate now is, is to, to maintain uh, price stability. Uh, and this, this crisis uh, <clears throat> has not been good for uh, the inflation outlook. Our overall assessment is that uh, the demand uh, factors, the negative demand factors related to, for example, the impact of uncertainty on consumption and investment, and also the, the fall in, in external uh, demand, uh, do outweigh some of the, the positive supply shocks that we see. You know, we did see uh, somewhat of an increase in food price inflation, uh, for example, uh, during uh, the pandemic. In the short term, there's a lot of uh, uncertainty. Um, you, you, you have noticed that uh, actual HICP inflation in August, uh, and you see some of the, the elements here, uh, uh, dropped to a negative number of minus 0.2%. Uh, but this is mostly due to uh, temporary factors. The three main temporary factors uh, underline sort of the extraordinary uh, nature of this, this, this negative uh, inflation. I, I wouldn't call it uh, deflation given its temporary uh, character. The first one is that we had a big drop in the oil price in the past uh, uh, basically early this this year which is still still feeding through to uh, headline uh, inflation and energy price inflation secondly of course some of the governments took actions by reducing uh, vat uh, for example in, in in germany and this has a big impact again temporary impact on the profile 
of uh, both headline and uh, core inflation, as you can see uh, again on the left-hand uh, side, which should wash out uh, at the beginning of, uh, of, of, of next year, in the first half of, of next year. And thirdly, uh, August in particular was uh, affected by the fact that some of the sales periods, particularly in France and Italy, were moved from July to, to August. So you had many more sales in August relative to usual seasonal patterns. And again, that put the downward uh, pressure. Uh, but of course, this is not to say that uh, the inflation outlook uh, does not uh, look good. We, we expect that once that these temporary factors uh, wash out, inflation, uh, both core and headline, will gradually increase. Uh, but at the end of our uh, projection horizon, we have a headline inflation of 1.3%, which is way below uh, where we would like it uh, to see. Uh, and similarly for core inflation, if you look at uh, the right-hand side uh, uh, graph, so that's HICP excluding energy and prices, you see that uh, we have a slight upward uh, um, update, uh, upward move in, in the, our September forecast, uh, but still core inflation is around 1.1% in uh, 2022. So uh, again, uh, way below uh, where we want to see it, uh, which is uh, below but close to, to 2%. And then finally, um, uh, of course, uh, uh, DCB has uh, taken action uh, since uh, the, um, the start of the, the, the pandemic. Um, if you can uh, put up the slide, uh, Victor, uh, which gives a bit of an overview of, uh, of uh, our measures uh, since uh, March uh, um, of this year. Uh, I took this from, uh, from a recent speech by uh, Philip Lane, our, our chief economist and uh, uh, board member uh, for the Jackson Hole Conference. Uh, you can find it on our website. So the two uh, main, I mean, the, he talks about basically three challenges that uh, we as ECB uh, had to, uh, to face. Uh, the first challenge was to stabilize markets. There was a lot of market uh, displacement in the early phases uh, of the crisis. And that's where uh, particularly our uh, PEP program, the Pandemic Emergency Purchasing Program, um, has uh, helped uh, stabilize markets. Uh, one example is commercial paper markets, which basically dried up and, of course, inhibited uh, the financing of, uh, of firms, which is that market is, uh, again, alive and, and there is issuance. Uh, the other uh, big uh, fragmentation that we saw was in sovereign debt markets. And also there, uh, the flexible purchase program, the PEP, has uh, helped in, in bringing back uh, the spreads in sovereigns to, to levels that are cl much closer to what they were before uh, the pandemic. So that's a first uh, challenge, and I think that challenge we uh, so far uh, have faced uh, successfully. Uh, the second is to uh, make sure that in these very uncertain times where many firms will lose, have lost uh, revenues, that uh, liquidity and financing uh, continues to, to, to come on board. That's where our lending program, these are the the green parts, I think, sorry, I can't, should put up my, my glasses. Uh, so uh, so that's where, where our lending programs, uh, the, the targeted LTRO has been, uh, okay, so it's, it's, it's the, uh, the second, it's the green part, uh, and, and the, the different, uh, so the summary of the measures taken there. Um, so uh, where we, uh, uh, lend to, to, to banks at very favorable rates under the condition that they uh, maintain their uh, loan book uh, to uh, the, the non-financial corporate uh, sector, uh, including uh, small and medium-sized uh, enterprises. Um, as I mentioned before, I think also that's a challenge that uh, so far uh, we have faced successfully, at, at least uh, if you look at credit growth, it has, uh, if anything, increased as, as firms' uh, demand for, 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 for loans uh, increased uh, because of uh, the, the special uh, uh, situation. And then the third challenge is to offset uh, what uh, I showed a minute ago, basically the downward shift in uh, the inflation path looking forward, uh, given, again, our price stability uh, mandate. 
uh, again, that's where uh, the first set of measures, our asset purchases, uh, uh, are uh, helping, um, and, and particularly the, the recalibration that we did in June, the, the increase by seven, 600 billion of our asset purchase uh, program uh, has uh, helped in lifting uh, a little bit the uh, inflation path as we uh, saw uh, the difference between uh, the September and, uh, and the June uh, outlook. So this is what, and of course there's many details, uh, but uh, this is sort of the main um, elements of our monetary policy uh, response. Uh, what you have, some of the other elements, and particularly the last uh, row, which is probably not readable, uh, has to do with the supervisory measures, which went also hand in hand with our monetary policy measures, which were taken by the SSM, our super supervisory arm. And of course, what's not on this slide, uh, and uh, very important in this uh, crisis is what governments have done, and partic particularly fiscal authorities. Uh, over this uh, crisis phase, uh, governments have announced a fiscal stimulus together, national governments, of the order of 4.5%, which is uh, two to three times uh, larger than what was done in the financial crisis. And of course, this is a, a supporting factor for um for uh, for for the outlook and in addition to that of course we have also uh, a very historic uh, agreement uh, uh, amongst uh, governments in the form of uh, both the uh, sort of three uh, sa net uh, safety uh, networks uh, for households firms and governments um to the tune of 540 b uh, million billion uh, euros and probably even more important, the new generation EU program of 750 uh, billion. Some of these measures are not in our baseline forecast, and particularly, for example, the most recent French uh, announcement of a 100 billion uh, additional uh, stimulus is not in the September forecast. Also, some of the spending, additional spending that will come from the new generation EU is not in our forecast, and so that 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 uh, constitutes a bit of an an, an upside uh, an upside uh, risk, which uh, hopefully will balance uh, the many sort of downside risks that uh, that I also talked uh, about. Overall, the, the governing council saw the um, the risks to the downside. So, if we think about those two scenarios, there was more relatively more weight on the downside risk, and and of course that. Uh, also has led to the message that uh, the president uh, gave about uh, no complacency in terms of, uh, of of our mandate. Let me stop here. I probably took way too long. Uh, and Thank you very for, much, Frank. Uh, I don't think it was too long. Thank you very much for this uh, presentation. Um, I'm sure our participants will now have uh, a number of questions. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, if you'd like to ask a question, please raise your electronic hand. Once your name has been called, uh, you will be able to start speaking and also, if you choose so, uh, to turn on your camera. Uh, of course, if your organization has released uh, pr any projections recently, please also share with us uh, those numbers. And if you have any comments on uh, um, the, the projections that Frank presented, please also share those uh, with us. And finally, please state uh, the name of your organization and your role in it. Uh, if you don't mind. Uh, one more time, please raise your electronic hand if you'd like to um, ask a question. Once you hear your name uh, called, you may start speaking and you may also want to switch on your uh, camera. Um, if your organization has released any projections recently, please share those with us as well and uh, please state the name of your organization and your role in it. I can see that there is uh, Stan Jordan who would like to um, start the discussion. Stan, if you are ready, you can uh, turn on your camera, please, and uh, you can start speaking now. Can you hear me? Yes, sir, we can hear you, absolutely, thank you. Excellent. Well, uh, good. Um, yeah, hello everyone. Thanks for organizing this uh, seminar. It's good that the ECB is making efforts to reach to civil society. My name is Sandro, and I'm working for I'm the director at Positive Money Europe. We are an NGO based in Brussels, and we do work on monetary policy as well. Um, so I have uh, a remark and a question. So 
obviously one of the greatest uncertainty is this notion is this problem with the excess savings uh, that occurred um, so we've seen huge numbers in, ex in additional savings but of course when we look at those numbers those are aggregate um, and the reality is much more granular because certain income groups have much more uh, savings than others and the crisis as well has affected uh, groups differently so uh, I think the issue there is that certain income groups have probably not had any added savings. Uh, low income uh, people have been much more affected by this crisis. Uh, if, if you are a freelancer or if you are low income, you don't necessarily uh, benefit from partial unemployment schemes, for example. And in that respect, what can the ECB do? Because the ECB, all the tools you mentioned, and obviously I, I respect the fact that those, those actions were needed, but all those tools, they are only uh, easing borrowing constraints essentially at the bottom of it. So if you are a precarious worker, if you don't enjoy personal employment schemes, if you're in employment, how do these policies help people? Um, and if um, and and because it's not just about uh, the equity aspect of this, it's also because ultimately the economy is made more fragile by the fact that certain income groups are, are really falling down and then because there is uh, interdependency uh, in the economy. Certain businesses, certain sectors are going to be most affected, not in aggregate, just by because their clients are those specific people, and then you have a whole chain effect. So I'm wondering, how do you, first, do you really take those things seriously, looking at the granular? Because I see some headline speeches by some governors that are really uh, saying, we don't have a problem with consumption because we have excess savings. And I think we have to get much more real here. So are you looking at that? on the research aspect and also in terms of policy, where do you see the potential for improving monetary policy so that we get a better, we, we address this issue much better. Thank you. Thank you very much, Stan. Frank? Yeah, I mean, thank you very much, uh, Stan. Uh, no, these are very uh, important uh, considerations. And of course, we, we do look uh, also uh, behind uh, the aggregate uh, numbers. And, um, uh, one of the tools that we are developing is actually a sort of a, a consumer expectations survey, which is a, a microeconometric uh, survey, which uh, will hopefully, uh, particularly in the future, uh, we are in a pilot phase at the moment, uh, give a much richer uh, uh, information set about how different parts of the society and of households are, are affected. I mean, one of the things uh, that comes out uh, from, from, again, some of that pilot work is, is exactly what, uh, what, uh, what you're saying. What we find is there's a lot of heterogeneity in terms of the impact of the pandemic and the containment measures on uh, poor versus uh, more rich uh, households. So one of the things that we find is that actually when you belong to the sort of the poor uh, segment uh, of uh, society. Uh, in that case, actually, your income is relatively more affected, whereas your consumption opportunities are relatively less affected. I mean, one way of explaining that is, of course, if you're poor, you spend a lot on basics, not food. And, and of course, there, there was no uh, uh, constraint, uh, but prices did increase quite a bit. So. Uh, so consume, consumption was okay, but but of course it's the poor segments that were affected mostly by uh, by by some of the the negative developments in the labor market uh, and and uh, unemployment, the rise in unemployment, the drop in employment. So we're talking basically about five million people that have become unemployed, um, uh, or no, five million people that uh, are no longer employed. Uh, uh, since uh, basically in the first half of, of, of this, this year. Uh, whereas if you look at the richer segments of the population, what we see there is actually the opposite, that uh, those people, uh, those households are more affected in terms of their consumption opportunities. Again, these are the households, not the richer households that travel a lot, uh, that go to restaurants a lot, or potentially a lot. Uh, and of course, they couldn't do that. Whereas on the income side, they have been less affected because we know, and, and again, it's, 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 you can understand why, uh, because uh, often it's the richer that have uh, office jobs that, uh, that are the higher skilled, 
jobs which can easily uh, more transform uh, to transfer to to teleworking and so on and so forth so so again uh, we, we we make a big effort to try to increase our knowledge uh, there and this is also part of our strategy review which is is ongoing to 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 see uh, what we need to do in order to have a better better picture um so that's just acknowledgement now what can we do about it i mean uh, again uh, we are reflecting on this uh, also in, in this, this year-long strategy uh, discussion. Um, uh, but uh, I mean, first and foremost, you know, our actions are really geared at ensuring you know, that uh, price stability is maintained. Now, in order to do that, I mean, we have to respond to the drop in economic activity, to the rise in unemployment. And so, of course, how we do it is typically uh, I mean, it's it's sort of we are in unconventional time, so it, it's through different uh, instruments than the usual drop in the interest rate. But it's by maintaining credit flowing and interest rates and financial conditions uh, ease, and this will trigger uh, into into spending, support uh, the economy, reduce unemployment, and thereby also help. Uh, hopefully, and normally that that should be the case. Uh, um, sort of relatively more uh, those uh, those that are affected by by unemployment. So by by stabilizing the economy, we also stabilize uh, some of these distributional uh, effects because in, in the end, um, it's it's really the poorer parts of society that are affected most by by unemployment. And again, that's one of the things we see in 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 also our our micro uh, our micro data. Thank you very much, Frank. I hope, Stan, uh, this addressed your question. Uh, please remember to unraise your hand or lower your hand, of course, unless you want to uh, to speak later on again. I can see that we have uh, another request uh, for taking the floor. Just as a reminder, ladies and gentlemen, if you'd like to take the floor, ask questions or make any comments, please raise your electronic hand. Once your name is called, you will be able to speak and you may choose to turn on your camera. Uh, the next uh, participant intervening will be Martin uh, Schmalzrit. Martin, uh, you can start speaking now and turn on your camera if you wish. Please kindly state the name of your or organization and your role in it. Thank you. Uh, hello, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. So uh, my organization is Kofase Families Europe. So we, we are a European NGO representing the interests of families, but also consumers, consumer protection, financial inclusion, and all kinds of other uh, issues. Um, so thank you very much for your very interesting presentation. Um, it was really uh, uh, very detailed and uh, interesting. So um, the, what I wanted to point out is basically in the various forums where we are, uh, ECB, for instance, and the Banking Stakeholder Group or the FSUG, what we see is a, a sort of a fear of a Japanification of the world economy with the high debt over, overhang, private and public alike, and a sort of a locked in 0% interest rate and no growth. Um, and sort of also envisaging the long-term consequences of this crisis, like for instance, we're mentioning telework, um, all those empty office spaces uh, might also um, then trigger sort of cascading bankruptcies for real estate companies that can also affect the banking sector, obviously the travel uh, um, businesses and all businesses depending on, on travel and tourism, how are they going to be affected and we can't really count on the public sector to prop them up artificially via increasing public debt forever. But at the same time, allowing them to fail could set off uh, a real deep crisis. So. Um, and then regarding consumption, you're mentioning that um, consumption sort of settled at lower levels and savings were a little bit higher. Um, but um, when we're talking about sustainable development, for instance, it might be a good thing that people start uh, being a little bit more picky about what they consume uh, instead of having this uh, accounting on uh, a uh, continuous increase in consumption each year to sort of um, have this uh, smooth growth over time. Um, there's also no mention of the political risks uh, that this crisis has, has set off because I think many citizens might be very unhappy with the way it was handled. And you can clearly see that there's a big demograph, uh, democratic deficit here where um, many people found themselves in technocracies rather than democracies and their opinions counted for nothing as opposed to uh, experts in deciding what should be done in handling this, uh, this crisis. 
So that might also um, have a severe uh, political instability and backlash, which will not help in the economic recovery, which brings me to the final sort of overall consideration and the overarching question of whether a debt-based monetary system can handle a transition to a world where growth plateaus or decreases even over the long term, especially considering the challenges such as climate change, which will not help. So does the ECB basically envisage considering alternative ways of money entering and leaving circulation besides private bank lending in maintaining its its um, uh, and price stability and not just relying on, on that? So thank you very much for your time. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Martin. I mean, this, these were many, many observations and many, many questions. And I mean, if, if there's one thing that I think we've learned many things, but uh, one thing from our perspective uh, that we've learned is that obviously for many of these things, we shouldn't be looking at central bank. No, it's, it's, it's really um, the times when uh, some people thought uh, central banks were almighty. I mean, that's that's finished. And again this is first and foremost a uh, very important health crisis it's also a crisis that is i think related to some of these longer term challenges that uh, we will be facing inclu including uh, climate change and you touched uh, upon that but first and foremost it's it's, it's governments and, and other authorities that have to deal with those uh, those, uh, those 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 problems um, I mean, let me just say quickly a few words on, on some of the elements that you, you mentioned. First of all, fear of uh, Japanification. Um, I mean, uh, we're clearly not there uh, at the moment. So, I mean, there is no sense in which uh, there is a high probability of deflation uh, at the moment. If anything, what we have seen is that inflation expectations have somewhat stabilized. If you look at market-based uh, inflation expectations, have to sort of backed up uh, a little bit. And in general, uh, the surveys show that inflation is still, it's low, uh, but we're talking about no 1.6%, uh, so which is not, it's, it's, it's lower than we would like it to be, but it's also uh, not zero and it's not, uh, not, uh, not negative. And of course, all our actions are, are really geared at making sure that uh, we can converge back to something that is close to 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 two percent. Um, now it, it is uh, also obvious that, uh, and that's why I also had this idea of transformation in my mind in the third uh, phase of this crisis, that uh, we will not go back to ex ante. We we will have to organize our economy a little bit uh, differently. Uh, but of course, that's a much bigger set of issues than than just uh, uh, the, the 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 health crisis, uh, and again, I mean, I don't want to to refer too much to our strategy view, but but you know that some of these these bigger structural changes like climate change will feature in in uh, uh, reviewing our uh, policy strategy. I mean, what's what's important is indeed that, and this will be a very difficult balancing act. Uh, is this transition from support measures? I mean, we still are at the end of rescue and support, no? which is very important in this crisis. Mode. But at some point, we have to move towards transformation, reallocation. Um, and so, as you said, we cannot uh, keep on supporting firms that no longer have a demand, that no longer have a business case. Um, and so, and, and we know uh, that uh, there will have to be these structural changes. Um, this is true uh, to some extent uh, for our measures, no? in the sense that some of the measures about, for example, supervisory measures at some point will have to uh, trans transit into much more uh, targeted measures and also allowing for this reallocation of, of, of credit. But it's also true for all the other measures that has been uh, taken. And to find that balance in, in terms of making sure that we don't fall off the cliff when this stops, but at the same time uh, have a ramp. Uh, I think uh, there was somebody mentioned we need to go from the cliff and have a ramp into this, this kind of new, 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 new normal. I mean, do we need to consume less? I mean, I don't know. This is uh, maybe this is not to, to, to me to, uh, as a central banker to say, but I mean, personally, I, I think that uh, 
we don't necessarily need to consume unless we need to consume differently you no know? there's many ways in which we can enjoy life and consume um which which are much less uh, taxing on our our resources on our natural uh, resources so i don't worry too much about this discussion about growth versus no uh, growth i think we will have growth because that's part of 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 the innovation uh, and and the, the sort of the longing for 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 creativity innovation that 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 we have in our in our societies and in our uh, uh systems um but it will have to be different and and of course that will have to be to be uh to be uh, accompanied by uh, the right policies and here i would say again it's not really the central bank but it's it's really the governments uh, and I would put in uh, you know, uh, the, the, the strong welcome and support that also the governing council has, has put up for uh, the new generation EU fund, which, which clearly signals out, signals out uh, some of the key priorities you know, in terms of uh, climate change and in terms of uh, digital uh, revolution. And it's clearly that, in my view, that this cannot be stopped if you think about digital, but we need to have policies that allow everybody to 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 participate in in what I think will be uh, very exciting new uh, developments. Let me not talk about the political instability. I mean that's definitely a risk. It's a global risk, uh, and uh, um, uh, but again, uh, from that perspective, we're just humble bureaucrats. Thank you very much, Frank. I hope, Martin, that addressed your question. I'm being conscious of the time, but uh, I hope we can still uh, manage to um, give the floor to two uh, participants that would like to ask questions. So let's try to do it uh, a bit quicker. Mary Collins would be the first one, and then Henry Eviston are uh, the participants that raised their hands. Uh, Mary Collins, uh, you the first one. You may start speaking now and switch on your camera if you wish. Okay. I'm not sure I'm going to make it. So rather than waste time, and um, it's not that I don't want to see you, but I just don't manage to find the camera. First of all, I would also like to say thank you very much for organizing this event. This is really great to have this exchange amongst us. I'm representing the European Women's Lobby, which is the largest organization of women's organizations in the European Union, representing over 2,000 women's organizations in 30 countries. I think for us, this crisis has shown how women played a massive role of upholding the whole economy and society. And it also made visible the undervaluing of women's work, and particularly in areas where women work, health care, cleaning, education, really has been undervalued for a long, long time. So we think the time has come to change that and that we're not really making the right investments. What we saw after the financial crisis was a real politic of austerity measures, which in fact um, led to some of the crises that we had in the health systems um, a couple of months ago, because over the years there was a disinvestment in those sectors. So we believe that the time has come to change. Our economic model has shown its weaknesses and its limits as well. So we would like to see more massive investments in public services, particularly those services that have played a key role in the last couple of months, and that's particularly health, uh, care, um, education as well. So my question to you is, will the central, will the European Central Bank support this kind of a change and move to a different economic model, one which will entail in the short term an increase in public deficit because it's about investing massively in public services. But in the long term, as this crisis has shown, will be of benefit to us all, because it is about long-term investment and long-term spending. So I'd like to have your um, opinion on that. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mary. I appreciate your question, Frank. Yeah, um, let me be short this time. Um, uh, I mean, obviously, the, what the, the, the issues that you, you, you mentioned are really uh, there for governments uh, to, 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 take care, to, to take care of. Um, and, and definitely, uh, I mean, 
these uh, sound reasonable uh, choices, particularly uh, also uh, following the, the, this particular uh, uh, crisis. Uh, our policies are there to uh, facilitate uh, financing of projects, including uh, of uh, governments. Uh, and so, but it's up to, to governments that uh, to, to decide you know, where, where to spend and what uh, to spend. Um, uh, from our uh, side, in order to uh, make this this big increase in deficit spending, which uh, we are seeing, and, and uh, it is uh, much uh, bigger, as I, I mentioned, than in the financial crisis, to also uh, sustainable. I mean, it's it's important that uh, the, a lot of this money is is also spent in uh, investment and uh, public investment. Um, has uh, is at a very low level um, for 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 a number of reasons, um, and can actually support uh, growth uh, in the future, and thereby also support uh, the sustainability of 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 the the public debt that we that governments are are, are taking up. So, um, uh, but in the end, as I said, to to specific choices about where to spend is of course a government a government question. Thank you very much, Frank. And we now going for the final question to Henry Eviston. Henry, uh, please uh, tell us something about your organization and your role in it. You can start speaking now and you can switch on your camera. Uh, good afternoon. This is Henry Eviston from WWF, European Policy Office. Um, my connection is a bit slow, so I, I hope my voice will suffice. Um, I suppose the COVID crisis has provided very clear evidence of the links between healthy ecosystems, healthy people, and the healthy economy. Uh, specifically, if we want a healthy economy, we need to stop damaging our environment, uh, starting by ending support for fossil fuels. Both the ECB by June of this year had acquired assets worth almost 8 billion euros from highly polluting companies. So given what we know about the importance of healthy ecosystems for the economy, Will the ECB commit in its strategy review to align its asset purchasing programs, its collateral frameworks, and its refinancing operations to the banking sector with the Paris Agreement, in particular to ensure that they do not support fossil fuels? And will it use the EU taxonomy of sustainable investments to accomplish this? Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Henry. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I mean, important questions. Uh, and I mean, as you know, this is indeed one one of the, the topics that's that is very much on our agenda in the strategy review. I, I cannot really uh, sort of answer the question because that will uh, depend on on the outcome. Um, but uh, I understand there will also be a, a seminar, a webinar with uh, all of you, particularly geared towards the uh, the strategy review and so i'm sure you can ask that question uh, again to to our president indeed uh, thank you very much uh, frank we will be uh, trying to organize similar um, gatherings uh, in the future be it with experts or policymakers at the ecb and um, the next one of course will be in the framework of the strategy review and the whole ecb license initiative on the 21st of october there will be an ecb license event with uh, the president lagarde and certainly uh, that will be the platform where you can raise um, such issues. There is also an ECB license portal open and available to you if you'd like to make use of it to submit your um, suggestions or input uh, into the strategy review process, which, by the way, Frank is also managing together with, uh, with some colleagues within the ECB. But uh, on the projections, that was it from us today. Thank you very much, Frank, for presenting it and answering the questions. Thank you very much, uh, ladies and gentlemen, for joining us online. As said, uh, the video recording of this event will be made available on the ECB website together with the slides from today. We hope to see you very soon, but please stay safe otherwise. Thank you very much and bye-bye.